communities. I'm Jeff Marcel with TIP Strategies. We're a co-sponsor of the program. Um, we had a very successful first day of the conference, um, and that was really dedicated to a national audience. Today is really dedicated to the East Valley community. And this is really the crux of the two-day conference. It's the heart of the work that we want to get accomplished over the next over these past two days. As a quick recap of what was discussed uh, yesterday, we heard some from some outstanding speakers. We heard from GoDaddy, we heard from Venture Forward, we heard from Empower, who shared research that they're doing to and work they're doing to support micro businesses promoting digital access for entrepreneurs with a focus on underserved communities. Um, we also heard from a representative from the National League of Cities um, and the work that they're doing to support entrepreneurs in, in the work they're doing in collaboration with the Kauffman Foundation. At TIP Strategies, we share the analysis work that we've done so far for the East Valley community, both the quantitative statistical information that we gather, but also the qualitative information that we gathered from stakeholders across the East Valley community. We also shared some national best practice examples for small business support programs. And then we heard from a panel of East Valley leaders and organizations supporting entrepreneurs and small businesses. This included representatives from Cohoots, from Local First, and a representative from the Better Business Bureau. Um, they all shared the challenges that they're hearing from entrepreneurs and small business owners um, but they also talked about the work that they have going on right now to support those folks. Um, so day one has been recorded. We're going to share that recording with everyone. And we're going to send out an email to everyone that's been registered for the conference. And uh, you should see that in your inbox. We anticipate that will go out tomorrow so that if you had to step away, you can relive the, uh, the first day of the conference and play it at your convenience. So just a few housekeeping notes for today. We're gonna to ask that everyone stay muted unless you are speaking. Um, and then we also encourage you to use your video um, throughout today, especially during the Q&A sessions and the breakout sessions. Um, and if you'd like to ask a question of any of the panelists, we'd like you to use the chat box and you'll see that on the lower menu bar, um, but please put your questions in the chat box and. We'll follow up each session with a Q&A portion. So with that, I, it's my pleasure now to hand it off to Jay O'Donnell for our opening session where she's gonna introduce some economic development professionals in the East Valley community that I think everybody should be familiar with. So Jay, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. And uh, thank you again to everyone who's participating today. We're really excited about today. Um, we have a great agenda a plan, a plan for you. I think that um, what we're going to do today and the way we've laid out the itinerary is really set the stage to give you an idea of how we have already worked together as East Valley Cities and then to hear from the businesses themselves who have worked with cities and how um, as entrepreneurs they have utilized the city services or programs and where we potentially shine and where municipalities might be able to do a little bit better um, working with our partners. And then obviously moving into the breakout rooms where um, we feel like we'll really be able to get to the meet and get some recommendations uh, on paper so that we can move forward with a strong business plan um, on how we wanna cooperate. So, let me introduce first my two panelists. Uh, Doreen Cott is the Economic Developer, Development Director for the Town of Queen Creek. And Doreen has been with the town for more than 14 years. And she has been working in the economic development field for 22 years. Dan Henderson is a certified economic developer and is the Economic Development Director for the Town of Gilbert. And he's been with Gilbert since 2007. Uh, I'm also proud to say that all of our offices, Mesa, Gilbert, and Queen Creek, have earned accreditation through the International Economic Development Council. So we're really proud of, of that honor. The goal of this session this morning is to hit the highlights of how we in the East Valley have been working together to give you an idea of what has come before so you can start to think about what may transpire and how we could best work together um, to achieve our goals for this particular initiative. 
And most of you already know that the Phoenix East Valley uh, is several cities, including Tempe, Mesa, Chandler, Apache Junction, Gilbert, and the town of Queen Creek. So our cities, along with several other cities in the greater Phoenix area, are members of GPEC, the Greater Phoenix Economic Council, which is a very strong and effective regional economic development organization that leads business attraction efforts in Maricopa County. And as economic developers in the Phoenix East Valley, uh, which is a sub-region of, of Greater Phoenix, um, we have a population of 1.5 million people. And as I mentioned, we've been working in various capacities across different divisions or departments within our cities. Um, but we in the offices of economic development have been more focused on branding and marketing. So we partner to attend trade shows, sales missions, we host Phoenix East Valley familiarization tours with media or site selectors. We partner for visitor industry marketing as well. And together we... Can you hear me okay? Okay, sorry about that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that when there isn't a pandemic, we also, as economic development professionals, um, are friends and we go to happy hours together, which I think is something that, um, you know, just helps in terms of build relationships and rapport. So when we considered this NLC first tier suburbs grant opportunity, it, it seemed like a natural decision for us to come together. Um, and, and obviously we care about our individual communities, but we recognize that it's important to cooperate regionally because we can leverage our resources. So the, the themes of our application centered around three things under the broad topic of resiliency, equity, and inclusion. So first we wanted to elevate the conversation about small business support. We wanted to discuss what cities are willing to do short-term and long-term for small business services. How do we want to go forward after the pandemic? Uh, we recognize that the economic development agencies is focused primarily on attracting larger businesses in base industries. And those businesses are critical in helping build a diverse economy. However, small businesses are the real economic engine in Arizona. So as we debate our emphasis and the right balance between attraction, retention, and expansion, what makes sense for us as a region? What is going to be adopted as the standard of care? And can we do this as a region? And what sort of ongoing regional coordination do we provide with the same fervor as attracting new businesses to the market? Second, re resiliency means building strong businesses. The pandemic forced us to scramble and pivot and fine tune our focus to save businesses. But it's imperative now that we as leaders and partners design, develop and implement a program or a center for focusing on building the health of small businesses. So with nearly half of our working population employed by small businesses, we have to maintain the vitality and be able to sustain these businesses. Um, they're just as important as the larger employers. So making sure that small businesses are viewed as a priority and that they are trained to become healthier. Third, modernizing our service lines to build inclusive economic development. We can't be all things to all people and we know there are partners well equipped to serve small businesses in big ways. However, what we stated in the grant application is that we are looking for help in establishing a universal standard of care that we can work toward, and we need to be in the small business development business. And as professional economic developers, we should expect and offer the same level of coaching or counseling to each business and from each agency, either by embedding the expertise on our staff in cities or by partnering with organizations already working well in these niche areas. So um, we have ideas, but we need to hear from you, the community and the leaders and stakeholders who work in this space and really understand what it takes to execute an effective program. Um, but that, that was just to sort of lay the foundation and give you an idea of what the grant 
um, was about and what we asked to do and what our goals were. So again, wanted to give you an opportunity to know how we've worked together already over the course of the last few years. I will turn it over to Doreen and she will talk about the Phoenix, Phoenix East Valley Branding and Marketing Initiative. And then Dan Henderson will present how we've collaborated to execute Phoenix to East Valley E-Week. Doreen. Great, thank you, Jay. Um, so as Jay mentioned, we, we are really good at working together and it's always a pleasure to um, participate in these events with our, with our friends. As, as Jay said, you know, we're not only professionals in our respective cities, but we, we really do rely on each other and those friendships and those relationships because um, I, I know for a smaller town, you know, Queen Creek looks sometimes to the bigger cities for ideas and opportunities um, for us to implement in Queen Creek. So Phoenix East Valley Marketing and Branding is really regional, regionalism at its best, in my opinion. We all recognize that individually, our respective cities and towns are growing and thriving. However, when we collaborate like we do, we are tremendously stronger. Uh, we've really created a, a great sense of place in the East Valley. We um, are This allows us to promote a stronger and more diverse workforce, as well as a more interesting place for tourists to visit because together, we offer a variety of attractions um, from the spring training facilities in Mesa, vibrant walkable downtowns, riparian preserve, um, agritainment destinations. We truly separate the Phoenix East Valley from any other place. And so um, as Jay mentioned, regionalism is not new to the Phoenix East Valley. Over the years, the cities and towns have collaborated and participated in trade shows like Cornet um, that allow us to maximize resources. We all have limited staff and limiting fu limited funds. So when we can go in together on a large trade show and pay for a booth and, and share the time, um, it really allows all of us to have a presence, um, but really maximize our resources because it's something we're, you know, we're always expected to do. Um, we also um, have collaborated on the East Valley Regional Summit that was led by the town of Gilbert and really appreciated them taking the lead on that event. But again, inviting the East Valley cities to participate so we could sell the whole area to site selection consultants from across the nation. I know when I participated on that particular um, tour and event, you know, we're going through the cities of Chandler and Mesa and Gilbert, and even I was surprised by the amount of growth and the projects that were underway or just opened. And it really was um, quite impressive. And um, I was just glad to have an opportunity to um, sell Queen Creek because, you know, we are smaller and younger and we, we are in a different economic life cycle from some of the larger cities. Um, so it really was a great opportunity for us. And we appreciate that, that ability to collaborate and, and to sell the entire area. We also um, share exciting news through regional marketing promotion. Um, there was, um, you know, there's always articles posted about the East Valley. Um, next slide, Jen, if you, if you don't mind. Um, we, there was an article in Inc. Magazine um, that um, kind of focused on the East Valley and the tremendous level of collaboration. And this, this graphic just kind of shows the, the marketing, the unique assets in each of the East Valley cities. Um, and we've, um, as Jay mentioned, we've also done FAM tours where we've brought in new people to the area and we've taken them out to some of the unique destinations. And in this case, an example was an agritainment destination. And so that they were able to experience everything that the area has to offer firsthand. Um, and then one picture did show um, a stop at Schnett Farms on the FAM tour, which was exciting for Queen Creek. Um, and then I just, again, like the area's strong demographics are something that the Enix, Phoenix East Valley does um, do well in marketing because our workforce in just Queen Creek isn't as strong um, unless we include Mesa and Gilbert and Chandler and the entire East Valley. So it really does make us a stronger um, look for site selectors. And then next slide, please. Um, this is a screenshot of the cover of the Phoenix East Valley profile. Um, the, the Phoenix East Valley, East Valley Partnership updates this each year. 
And it's a great example of the power in numbers. So if you want to see this economic profile online, um, it you know, something that we share with um, businesses looking to open or expand and relocate. And it's just uh, a, a great tool for us to have at our fingertips. And then I'll just finish um, just one very uh, recent example. Um, just yesterday, East Valley Cities were on a call planning Entrepreneurship Week for 2021. And I know Dan's going to touch on that a little bit. But we were also brainstorming on how to promote a new marketing platform that can help small businesses with their marketing and help them generate new customers collaboratively. So, you know, we look at these opportunities um, holistically and um, sometimes it's, it's easier to tackle a problem or a challenge together in a group um, rather individually. So I hope um, this kind of gave you a flavor of the different ways that we have collaborated over the years. I, I look forward to continuing our relationships and the spirit of regionalism as we move forward. Even um, through COVID, you know, I know some of the first people I called were Jay and Dan, and it's like, hey, what are you guys doing? You know, um, any ideas? You know, what kind of things are you seeing in your, your small business community? And I, I, I just, I, I think it's great that we have these really strong relationships. So with that, um, I will turn the time over to Dan with the town of Gilbert. Thank you, Doreen. Um, appreciate the opportunity to be with you all today and um, and share some of the great work that that we're doing collaboratively. Um, I think, um, you know, as I contemplate what Doreen has said, and certainly um, the the introduction done by Jay, I think this idea of regionalism working together really is ingrained in the Phoenix East Valley communities. We gave you a brief overview of what those communities are uh, in the East Valley. And I, I strongly feel that the most effective way to improve the vibrancy and resiliency of a region is to embrace not only that holistic perspective, but to embrace regionalism. And so our approach to community and economic development strategies while we are tasked in our own communities with developing a brand and a narrative, um, we do work very collaboratively together and I'll showcase some of those here in a moment. But you know, when we approach economic development and community development strategies in a regionalism nature, you know, we're, we're contemplating partnering at every minute um, on the attraction and expansion um, as the core economic development services that we provide. But we're also collaborating constantly on workforce development, certainly quality of life. Um, we know that um, housing is a big component in building communities. Um, transportation um, is essentially borderless. Uh, we, we really connect um, together through our regional approach, not only to economic development and community development, but also in transportation master planning. Um, we collectively through the East Valley communities have built just a tremendous quality of life. Um, and, um, and we feel that that economic inclusion also plays a critical role in the health of, of our regional economy here in the Southeast Valley. And so um, some of the examples that I wanted to draw upon where we have very specifically worked together um, and, and collaborated together is, um, is obviously with, with our six communities. And again, I'll remind you, those six communities are Apache Junction, Chandler, Gilbert, Mesa, Tempe and Queen Creek. And um, when we plan our strategies for the year, um, it helps that we organize around happy hours, certainly. But, um, but beyond that, um, you know, we're looking at those groups and events that contribute to the East Valley economy. And one of the things that I'll talk very specifically about is the Phoenix East Valley Entrepreneurship Week. Um, there are other examples of um, the Phoenix Startup Week, um, East Valley Innovates, certainly familiarization tour, tours, not only on the economic development front, but also on the tourism front. 
Um, and then through a collaborative group known as the East Valley Partnership. That's a regional economic development group that assists us in branding not only our communities, but more importantly, our East Valley region. And so entrepreneur, East Valley Entrepreneurship Week, um, um, an example of that, it, it took place last year in, in 2019. Um, and it was just that over, over a week, uh, a week in February. Um, which is a beautiful time of year to be in the Phoenix metropolitan area. And um, we were able to embrace a lot of the uh, different uh, attributes and positive attributes of our venues. In some cases, bringing groups together outside, but also uh, inside to create some of the intimacy necessary to engage our small business community. And so Entrepreneurship Week really focused on educating, inspiring, and promoting entrepreneurs um, and those startups. Um, and they represented a wide variety of industries here in the East Valley. Um, and so we were sort of agnostic as to what type of industry we really wanted to embrace that ecosystem of entrepreneurship and startup. Um, East Valley E-Week featured workshops and networking events um, hosted throughout the East Valley community. So it gave a chance to um, not only um, uh, create an identity for um, each individual community, but it also allowed um, those individuals that wanted to attend multiple events in different communities to see how we come together. Um, and that really showcased our regionalism and our approach to togetherness, if you will. Um, and so throughout that week of February, um, you know, it was that opportunity to learn and connect, quite honestly. Um, we collaborated as an East Valley uh, uh, as an East Valley entity to create a logo graphic templates. Um, we collectively obtained sponsorships throughout the local um, um, utility organizations. We pitched local media um, on stories to gain additional exposure. Um, used um, each group's um, social media strengths through, through a comprehensive social media campaign. Um, and developed a landing page for additional information and registration to serve as that single point of contact um, for entrepreneurs so that they didn't have to differentiate between the communities, but rather come together and just sort of be treated as one. You know, and so um, that was uh, that was an incredible week for us. Um, each community, I'm going to describe a little bit what each community did um, as part of this e-week um, in, uh, in Mesa, uh, Mesa's creative economy. They um, Mesa has really created a hotbed for creativity and innovation. And so um, as part of the community's renaissance with entrepreneurs and creatives, um, they were able to bring new ideas as well as showcase the resources um, on behalf of the community. And, and those that attended were able to learn about the intersection of sort of ingenuity and business in the creative economy. In Queen Creek, um, we, uh, we, we were really focused on uh, networking and developed a hack night. And so if you've ever thought about starting your own business or learning about additional resources um, specific to Queen Creek, but also in the East Valley, this was a wonderful event to, to attend. Um, at that particular hack night workshop, um, there was a wide range of topics from creating a business plan, to, um, to really drilling down in on data and demographics and sharing the entrepreneur story. Um, and then the workshop uh, was followed by networking with other entrepreneurs. Um, uh, and it was a wonderful event over at Old Ellsworth Brewing Company. Um, and, then, uh, and then a visit to Hack Night at a, at a nearby gangplank uh, sort of accelerator incubator type concept um, that's proliferated in the region. Um, the Gilbert component was uh, embraced uh, both a, a daytime event as well as an evening event, and it was um, really focused on the art of negotiating um, uh, business growth and um, to help create sort of a, a launch and learn about the different resources. And so these collective uh, events in the different communities really brought uh, a wide um, variety of entrepreneurs to the table showcasing attributes in the communities while also encouraging entrepreneurs to, to, um, to be curious and want access to additional resources and really be embraced borderless. You know, it wasn't about what this community could do for you. However, that's important. Um, it was more so about how that entrepreneur and startup community was supported through resources and through a collective um, um, organized group of resources. Um, 
Piggybacking off of that, uh, Phoenix East Valley Innovates uh, also was taking place in that uh, sort of second week, if you will, of uh, February. And that was an inaugural Phoenix East Valley Innovates. And that kicked off, uh, like I said, in more or less the second week of, uh, of February. And that event included sessions on financial lending sources, marketing assistance, e-commerce best practices, and really launching and expanding businesses. And so there were educational uh, sessions as well as, um, uh, again, lots of uh, networking and, and time and space for entrepreneurs to, to make those valuable connections. And, and so through this collaborative effort, you know, we were able to extend an East Valley brand um, and really um, allow the entrepreneurs and those uh, interested in starting uh, their ventures um, uh, with, a, with, with sort of this approach of, uh, of, of one resource in the, in the Phoenix East Valley. And so, um, you know, some of the other things uh, that we did uh, during that time is uh, we, we hosted a startup for micro and macro lending sources. Um, we also um, were encouraging people to take that leap and launch and expand their business concepts. Uh, Green Creek really uh, shined in, in that example. And, and um, you know, if you were looking to transform your business idea into reality, this event really helped um, those entrepreneurs and startups um, understand what it meant to take this from ideation to really creation and formation. And so that was really, um, really important. We had a number of partners um, at the table. Um, Seth Wells, uh, the founder of uh, Pilot Collective, Justin Rohner, the executive director um, and founder of Queen Creek's Botanical Gardens. We had Logan Brooks, um, the owner of Queen Creek's running company, um, and, uh, and others were, were all there to um, help really um, um, uh, embrace that idea of taking the leap and really launching your business. And then from Mesa's event, um, it was a lot about e-commerce for entrepreneurs and, and sort of those profits and pitfalls of selling online. Very, very informative and, and educational. They brought a number of different, um, not only um, groups together, but really discuss the e-commerce journey. Um, and I think it was very insightful, intuitive for, for those that attended. And so those are just some of the many examples of how we really embrace this, this holistic regionalism approach and really bring economic development core principles together with community development um, and address things like workforce, transportation, economic inclusion um, um, in, in the betterment of the overall health of, of not only the Phoenix metropolitan area, but most certainly the East Valley, um, uh, the, the, what we call the East Valley region or also known as the Southeast Valley. Um, and so with that, um, that really concludes my component of the presentation and uh, wanted to hand it back to Jay. And I will turn it over to Jeff, Marcel. I'm not sure if we had um, any uh, time at this point for questions. If there are questions throughout um, the presentations, please go ahead and put those in the chat. I'm sorry, I was remiss in, in not saying that before, but um, Jeff is uh, going to lead us into the next session. If, if there are any questions, feel free at this time, but thank you. Thanks, Jay, and thank, thank you to all of the panelists. That was fantastic information. It's clear that you all uh, are a model of collaboration. Um, I don't, we've only got just a moment, and um, if, if folks do have questions for all of the panelists, what we're gonna try to do is provide contact information for folks, so maybe if you wanna follow up with them with a question, they should be available to you. Um, but one quick question I have, um, just we've heard about some fantastic examples of collaboration and, and there's certainly a lot of love that goes around in the East Valley community, but share what are, what are the challenges that you've seen in terms of building that kind of collaboration? Are there things that you've experienced and had to overcome or, or, or has it all been just a, a, um, a, a strong partnership from the very beginning? What's, what, are the, what are the challenges you've overcome? That's an interesting question. Um, and I think that, you know, Dan and Doreen probably have a lot to add as well. I think um, even just how we've collaborated, there have been uh, initiatives or projects that we have um, wanted to work on together. And the nice thing about the way we're set up somewhat informally is that um, some of the communities can opt out. So uh, there may be, uh, you know, a reason, whether it be economic or political, uh, as to why um, a, a particular community wouldn't want to participate on a certain issue. 
Um, so that might be a challenge where we're not always clear on timing. Um, so timing can be an issue. And then, you know, financially, we have to obviously be sensitive to budgets and um, all, all of our budgets are different and we have a little bit different priorities. So, um, you know, we can't expect that everyone uh, sort of commit at the same financial level along the way. But I will tell you that it's been wonderful to have other partners when we do um, go to market, because as Doreen and Dan both mentioned, it's easier to leverage our region and really talk about the, the pros of the entire region to capitalize on that. Dan or Doreen, if you guys have anything to add to that. I, I think you covered it. Great, Jay. Okay. It just becomes a matter of maximizing our resources and, you know, contributing at the, the level that our community um, allows us to, which is sometimes different because of the size and uh, maybe the, the desired outcomes. But yeah, I think um, we've done it quite well. Yeah, Jay, I think you hit the nail on the head, sort of time and resources are uh, our contributing factor, but I think we've done a good job of, of trying to minimize that and really overcome that collectively as, as a group. Um, I think the, the, the notion that, um, that uh, we, we do have different um, uh, sort of uh, objectives, um, sometimes uh, politically um, and, and timing, candidly. You know, if someone's um, deploying a, a, a rather large initiative, um, now may not be the time, but I think that there's a lot of trust between the communities to say, hey, I, I may, may not be able to participate in this one, but I know that you'll be representing uh, the region really well. I um, also feel that um, the, the idea of trust has really um, brought us together um, over the years. And, and I think um, you know, the, the challenges uh, really lie yeah, in, in making sure that, um, you know, that, that the objectives of the East Valley are put first and foremost. And um, we've got a, a, lot, a great leadership group. Um, um, as you mentioned, uh, all of our economic development organizations on the phone today are accredited through IEDC. And that brings a tremendous amount of, uh, of regionalism. And, and we really try to um, break down those those borders and, and really try to act as a region when it's appropriate to do so in a marketing um, perspective or an initiative perspective. Um, but um, but I think trust really serves as the foundation for the relationships that we built over the years. Um, and I think longevity in our roles has really helped with that trust factor. Super. Well, I want to thank all of the panelists. And I'm going to ask you, you'll, you'll see a, a just a few really good questions in the in the chat, and I'm going to ask our panelists if you can respond into the chat. Um, we're running a little bit over time, but um, there are great questions, and and if you could share that that way, everybody can get a sense. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn it now over to Jennifer Graves to introduce our next panel. Thank you so much, Jeff. Really appreciate that. And um, hi, everybody. My name is Jennifer Graves, and I serve as the Deputy Director for the Gilbert Office of Economic Development. I'm really delighted to be here with you today to be moderating this panel um, and small business listening session with three East Valley entrepreneurs. Uh, we'll be asking them some questions today about the kind of assistance that they receive from the cities that they're located in and when they were getting started and, and anything that's helped them grow or expand. Um, getting their thoughts on what cities may need to do to prepare for the next generation of entrepreneurs, and then how they have adapted in the wake of COVID-19. So I um, want to get right into it. I'm pleased to welcome our panelists today. We have Eric Hervey from Mythical Coffee in Gilbert. We have Adam Small with Urbex Resources in Mesa. And we have Brian McKean from Old Ellswick Brewing Company in Queen Creek. Gentlemen, lovely to have you here today. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. And uh, to get things started, I'm gonna ask each panelist just to take a few minutes to introduce themselves and their business and tell us basically their story. So first, um, why don't we go ahead and start with Adam Small. Why don't you uh, kick us off, uh, Adam, with Urbix? Thanks, Jen. It's great to be here and be a part of this. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a East Valley native. I was born and raised in Tempe. I started my first serious business here in Mesa, and now I'm a resident of Gilbert. Uh, so I could, you could say I've 
been in the East Valley my entire life, literally. Um, I'm excited to be growing Urbix, uh, first and foremost, because it's a technology that we spun out of the University of Arizona back in 2016. Uh, City of Mesa helped us a lot in locating uh, our first facility. And by first facility, I mean a small lab uh, to do our material science work. And for our niche of industry, material science is very capital intensive. Uh, and usually that requires space and a lot of uh, capital towards equipment. And so Mesa really supported us in finding our location and allowing us to de-risk our technology to now grow to our 31,000 square foot facility, also in Mesa, uh, off of Greenfield of the 202. Uh, so really what Urbix does, uh, we refine graphite. Uh, we were the first graphite refining company in Arizona state history to take a natural form of graphite and refine it to a lithium ion battery grade material. Uh, Arizona has no graphite mines, but although that's a problem, it's not really the problem that our country's facing. The real problem is the bottleneck of refining. Uh, so with Mesa, the municipality in general, and all the support we've gotten, we've been able to accelerate this business that, again, is the first of its kind here in the state and is actually making waves uh, throughout the country and even the world. That's incredible. Thank you so much, Adam, for sharing that story with us. And uh, let's go ahead and go over to Eric with Mythical Coffee. Eric. Hi, good morning. Um, yeah, so I own Mythical Coffee with my girlfriend, Kat, and we started in January. Um, so basically around New Year's. And we opened um, right across from the town of Gilbert in Gilbert. Um, and it's been, it's been awesome. Um, we actually chose Gilbert um, largely because it just seemed like such a community-oriented place, um, and we we have seen that over and over again. Um, we yeah, we just have our little retail store, and we do some wholesale to a few coffee shops in the valley of our roasted coffee, um, and it's just been it's been fantastic just to see people embrace what we're doing. And I think it's hard um, just to to. I, th I think we take it for granted when people like what we do, but um, sometimes it's it's cool to see people jump on board um, and and enjoy what we're doing as well. So it's grew up in the in the U.S. even so um, I basically in high school, um, and that's been awesome to to kind of know Arizona as as a home. So it's been cool. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eric, for being here today. And uh, next, uh, let's take it over to Brian and uh, tell us about yourself and your story. Good morning, guys. Can everybody hear me? All right, perfect. So I'm Brian McKean. I own Old Ellsworth Brewing Company. Um, we are actually here because of the Economic Development Committee in the town of Queen Creek. I did a, a demographic study of my master's on the East Valley and kind of picked Queen Creek as my target market. Um, then we connected to the EDC in, in the town of Queen Creek because of an ad placed in a, a trade magazine. They joined the Arizona Craft Brewers Guild and really targeted a uh, microbrewery type business for Queen Creek. So that was, that was really awesome. Uh, it provided us the opportunity to move in here. Um, I think it's really important for communities to kind of support small businesses and uh, create that partnership. And throughout the entire process of opening in Queen Creek, we were uh, supported with information. Um, there were certain programs that we took advantage of uh, that helped us kind of make our vision a reality. We also continue to partner with uh, the town of Queen Creek and the Economic Development Committee any chance we get. Um, you guys will see our name pop up probably in, in some of the stuff they do. Um, and also in the future, uh, we're just looking forward to growing from where we're at now and kind of expanding beyond this. But uh, I can't talk enough about the partnership and actually the friendships that we've made with the, the Economic Development Committee and the town. So, so we're super proud to be here and, and uh, really happy to be a part of the community. That's awesome, Brian. Thank you so much for sharing that. And um, we're going to keep it on you uh, for now. And uh, each of you in your introductions did mention a little bit about what the cities did for you and how they've supported you so far. So could we elaborate a, lot, a little bit and what one or two things, you know, do you, what stood out that really helped you that the cities did for you to get open um, or that now that you're open, help you get settled, help you make contacts, 
supported the promotion of your business. Um, can you highlight some of that for us? Um, so in, in our own specific situation, um, the, the town, the economic development committee put the ad in the magazine. Uh, then we came down and met with them. I'll kind of tell you our, our short story. Um, when we came down, they showed us a list of different properties that would kind of fit what we were looking for after a short conversation. Actually, the, the location that we have right now, um, the, we were connected to the landlord by the Economic Development Committee. So that was very nice of them. Um, we're, we're very happy with our current location in, a po in opposition to the other ones. Uh, but beyond that, we also took advantage of grant programs. Like uh, Queen Creek does a lot of cool things for businesses to like fix up the outside of, of their building. So we took advantage of the uh, facade improvement program. Um, we've also taken advantage recently of a, a grant program related directly to COVID. Um, and we continue to try to take advantage of any program they, they put out. Um, they kind of let us know when they do new stuff. So that's a really cool partnership for us. Awesome, thank you so much. And um, Eric, how about you? Uh, anything that you can elaborate on in terms of specifically the resources that uh, Gilbert provided to you that really helped or things that uh, they've continued to do to try to help since you've opened in January because you opened right during um, probably you're the, the, the case study that we talk about when we say those businesses that opened basically right before COVID. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, can you share us a little bit more about that for us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and, and for reference too, like um, this is my first business venture, first kind of any, anything. I'm definitely as green, um, as naive as they come. And so it was cool. Um, I actually sat down with Dan like probably years ago now um, just to say, hey, what if we put, tried to put a coffee shop in Gilbert? And I've been met with nothing but positive and hopeful outlooks and as well as quite a lot of um, tailored advice, not just kind of generic like, oh, this is what a business could do, but like very specific and very kind of thoughtful advice. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, literally pertaining to um, permitting and building and inspections and signage and just what to look out for and like l literally everything, it's been, it's been amazing. So, um, and, and that was in, even in terms of finding a space um, and, and Lauren's been incredible with that. We've literally, uh, I think it's just saved our butts over and over again. So we, we self-admittedly have a lot to learn um but but it's been huge and i think I, I hear people all the time saying things like oh like they're kind of like fighting the city like they're like oh it's like us versus the city and we just have to like try to get this through and it's like the city's fighting us and all stuff and i'm like i've never experienced anything like that it's been it's been actually amazing so um like yeah sunshine and rainbows but um just despite all the all the craziness like we felt incredibly supported um, and, and yeah, they, they continue to, to find ways to reach out and to ask us how we're doing. And, and it's, we've, we've thankfully been doing well. So, um, I've, I've tried not to ask for a lot of assistance, um, because we, I think there are people that need it more. Um, but we're, we're incredibly grateful for the awareness and the presence, um, when there are, you know, hundreds or thousands of businesses that, um, need attention as well. So, yeah. For sure. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's really great to hear. Um, certainly don't mind the, the plug that um, it's all sunshine and rainbows in Gilbert, so we'll take it. Um, <laughs> I might be biased, but um, we, uh, we know our, our other municipal partners are also uh, sunshine and rainbows today. So the other um, thing I would like to go over to then is Adam and get your perspective, Adam, on you know, kind of those one or two things that you feel um, really, really stood out. Absolutely. I mean, to me, in our material science space, it is really hard to get credibility as a young entrepreneur. I mean, kind of similar to what he was just saying, you know, we were very green when it came to looking for you know, occupancy permits and zoning and building and air permits and water permit. Oh my God, I was so focused on our technology and our startup, let alone the little nuances behind the scenes you need to cover to still be a real business. Uh, so just having Mesa there to kind of hold our hand and 
not not necessarily judge us or, or be you know, skeptical of our ability to run our business, but understand that we're very good at what we do. We're not good at this stuff, which is help us get our building up and running. And so that kind of help from the municipality was was tremendous, um, but by far. Um, and not to mention even before that, being able to participate in their incubator program, the the advice, the connections, understanding, you know. It was kind of like a mini experiment of what our big facility would be. And so in that safe, you know, sandbox like zone within the municipality, we were able to grow our business and technology and make the right decisions when we decided to scale it up. Um, so it's really just them you know, plugging in the holes that we identified as something that we knew we did not know anything about. Um, and they helped us in a way that was not, like I said, not judgmental and not skeptical of our ability to, to start this big idea. And, and I think that was very, very helpful for, for a young entrepreneur. Awesome. Thank you for that feedback. And I'm going to stick on you right now and um, go into another question. I'm along the same lines, but um, more thinking about, you know, are there other resources or services that you were in search for that you didn't find access to that you think the cities could help fill a gap in? Um, it, we're going to talk a little bit about COVID and recovery and, and some of the response to the pandemic. Um, after this, but in general, anything that, that you would advise or from your perspective that, that municipalities should maybe bring to the table? Yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of a unique perspective. You know, they're, you know, they're a brewery, they're a coffee house, and then we're, a, you know, a graphite chemical plant. And so our business is already very naturally B2B. Um, so our employees, you know, we're not seeing customers coming through the front door. We already have a lot of personal protective equipment because it's a, a chemical process in a way. Uh, so we didn't really struggle so much when COVID hit other than expanding our, uh, you know, timing of employees when they come in, separate out their work a little bit more. So it took a little bit more time. Uh, but for us, it, it wasn't a big impact. We did take advantage of some of the, the payroll assistance just because of the, the uncertainties. Of, oh, pardon? Is this going to be six months, 12 months, 18 months? Uh, but other than that, we, we really thought that all the help that we got from Mesa before COVID is what put us in the position to be resilient through COVID. Great, that's awesome. And uh, Brian, I'm gonna go back over to you, uh, same question. Um, anything as you were starting up um, that you know you were really searching for that couldn't be fulfilled by the city? I mean, it sounds like Queen Creek um, did an amazing job with, with supporting you all, but any, any advice or suggestions you would have for, for things to add to the toolkit? I think that the most important thing that <clears throat> municipalities can do is just provide information. So that's always been our, our main resources to go back to the city or the EDC for, for information. Um, as a small business, especially in, in our industry, which is a super high risk uh, and something that you can't really guarantee success <laughs> right out of the gate, um, it's the hardest, the biggest hurdle for us was funding. And I don't know necessarily that uh, you would want your town or your city to do to get into that arena, but uh, that was probably our biggest hurdle. Maybe just uh, provide more local partnerships or, or something with uh, like regional banks that are more apt to invest in the specific community. Um, we, we just kind of struggled with funding a little bit when we first started. Excellent. Um, thank you for that. And, and we hear that a lot, certainly from um, businesses that are in that startup phase, you know, access to that funding. And sometimes, like to your point, it is really just finding um, those uh, banks that are willing to lend to smaller businesses, businesses that are starting up um, with that traditional finance um, versus, you know, having to go out and find venture or what most people do, friends and family financing and the like. So we definitely hear that a lot and appreciate that, that feedback. Um, and so, Eric, how about you? Any any advice for uh, municipalities on things that they could add to the toolkit? Um, no, no, I don't think specifically necessarily. I, I actually do think that um, Gilbert did an incredible job so far of um, communicating as a town, I guess, um, a lot of uh, just kind of what's going on. Um, and and that's, in a, in a sense, like, just feeling like you're in the loop is a huge hurdle because there is so much information um, and or misinformation in a sense too. Um, so I think just communicating clearly um, about the facts and about what's going on and the outlook. And um, I think communication for us is like the biggest thing because um, yeah, we, we feel like more empowered to be able to have like an outlook and a trajectory and 
an idea of kind of what to expect ongoing. Um, so I think uh, even though Gilbert specifically, because that's kind of what where we are, um, nailed that we we're definitely like feel like that's that's key, and I, a lot of that is technology based. Um, so I think maybe places that that aren't necessarily as up to date or as tech savvy or something like that would would really benefit from like even the daily communication that we saw from Gilbert. I appreciate that. We, we hear that often even um, because our businesses are members of our community. You know, oftentimes city communication, I think, is focused on residents and, and we try to always make sure that we're supporting the idea that not all of our businesses might be residents, but there are business residents and they're there every day. And so appreciate um, the feedback on that communication piece um, for what's happening. Um, obviously not just where you live, but also where you work. And so um, really, really appreciate that. And um, just to kind of dive a little bit more um, into, you know, COVID, um, the federal government, state government, county um, have put out different programs to help support businesses during COVID to reopen safely. Um, what, um, what programs have really stuck out to you, if any, um, or what have you done to adapt during uh, the pandemic to help um, you know, increase consumer confidence, but also to support your own business that you could share some tips or ideas or, or again, just your thoughts on some of the programs. And uh, we'll go that to you, Eric, first. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and yeah, I think we, we took advantage of the, the payroll assistance as well. Um, and I think that was, that was just like massive for a lot of people. Um, just to just to offset some of that cost, um, and and our, I think our our goal and our hope the whole time was like we don't want to lay anyone off and we don't want to cut anyone's hours or anything like that. So um, we were able to do that, and and that's like a big win for me, um, especially being very new. And so we were we were really happy kind of with that. So I think I couldn't have asked for more there, um, but and and also I will say. Um, a little bit uh, off the subject, but the coffee community is is incredibly supportive, um, and we received a, a huge amount of um, support from our friends and colleagues in coffee. And we had a lot of people, like our our the people that import our coffee um, from other countries, just reaching out and saying, "Hey, can we blast you on our social media? Can we can we represent you?" Um, and I think that sort of kind of collaborative marketing. Um, is huge and especially um, we, we've we've been posted on on different like social media kind of um, sites and and platforms and that has actually been probably the biggest thing that we've received um, in terms of support um, because we are so you know direct to to people coming in and grabbing a coffee but um, yeah our, our online business blew up as well um, and that's, I think, a big testament to that kind of online presence. Um, so I think the, the digital age, as it's so-called, is upon us. And it's, it's in a big way, I think, going to be one of the things that people can utilize as, in some ways, free marketing um, to, to build and to grow their business. And we've seen a ton of support through um, the town and, and, our, and our community from that specifically. Awesome, thank you. Um, really appreciate that. That's really great feedback. And um, Brian, I'd like to ask you the same question. You know, what um, what kind of services um, have you been able to take advantage of? You mentioned specifically Queen Creek's um, program uh, related to COVID and some support that they have there. Um, but anything else um, that you took advantage of or that you um, that really helped uh, in the in the pandemic? Um, yeah, so it's it's kind of an unprecedented time. We had went from uh, a sit down restaurant restaurant to a hundred percent takeout in uh, probably six hours. So we jumped from not having an online menu or an online ordering system to having one. Um, the the actual town supported us in that by they, in Queen Creek they have a shop local initiative that's that's really awesome. They list all the local businesses and stuff um, so that people can go on there and check them out. They did launch a, a open business type page. Um, I forget exactly what it's called, but Tori probably knows. Um, but uh, they listed all of us and, and uh, just let the residents and the community of Queen Creek know that we're still open, we're still here, we're still serving people. 
Um, it's just takeout only. We did take advantage of a lot of things on the federal level, uh, the EIDL loan and the, the PPP, obviously. Uh, Queen Creek did a local business grant um, that helped us offset some of the costs for um, signage and personal protective equipment and things like that. I mean, obviously we're a very clean restaurant, but we increased our uh, sanitization of, of high traffic surfaces and things like that. So there's a, a cost that goes into that. Um, but just, just the support and the exposure to the community to make sure that people know that we're still here. Um, cause we can, we, you know, we can promote ourselves as much as we want, but coming from that third party is, is a very important touch to, to different clientele, I, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, that makes a lot of sense. And, and that's great that you're able to take advantage of those programs. Uh, Adam, same question for you. Yeah, I mean, the, the payroll protection for us was big, purely because our type of business, it's similar to, to a brewery and coffee house, really. I mean, you spend a, a lot of money getting capital equipment. You have very long runways of installation. You have production goals you know, that are usually 18 to 24 months out when you make that first capital purchase. And so for us, knowing that you know, we're going to hit a certain revenue goal, say 12, 18 months from now, now that's pushed back 6 to 12 months that affects our ability to pay payroll and things like that. So having that protection to make sure that our people are covered so we can still continue the path of our capital equipment procurements, our setup and our you know driving towards that revenue number is covered. Because if we had to all of a sudden push back our revenue six months, that might've cost some jobs just so we can make sure we still have the capital for the equipment and, and things like that. So it really helped offset that uncertainty, which allowed us to stay on track. And although we still had some delays, it was nothing like what we were expecting the delays to be uh, because of the delay in revenue, perhaps. Gotcha. No, that's great to hear. And, you know, um, I want to take us next, though, over to um, a question about what comes next. So we've been hearing a lot about um, recovery. Um, you're certainly national statistics that are talking about whether a V-shaped recovery or a K-shaped recovery or some sort of modified you. Um, I'm not really sure uh, what's happening with the recovery. Um, it, it gets a little confusing out there, but um, we know we've seen some bump and a lot of good stuff coming in the economy, but um, we've also been hearing there's a trailing um, you know, decline and a, a perspective on that. And so as we continue to move forward, you know, what do you see for your business on the horizon and what kind of programs that maybe are currently in place that you took advantage of would help you sustain moving forward over the next you know, six, 12 months as we continue to really fully reopen and um, fully manage the pandemic? And uh, I'm sorry, Adam, I'll start with you. So, so really, I'm interested in some innovative new ideas for the municipality. You know, I feel the municipalities of the Phoenix East Valley are beautifully positioned to be some of the biggest benefactors of economic growth if they embrace innovative new ideas that test new industry potentials and engage directly and transparently with key stakeholders. So like one example, blockchain. At the root of any real blockchain is literally this notion of distributed consensus. To me, a municipality in many ways is nothing more than distributed consensus. So the consensus of voters establishes the government governance and initiatives of the municipalities. I think municipalities that will be most successful in the coming years will be those that embrace new means to engage their taxpayers and stakeholders, but with the highest levels of transparency, speed, and involvement. Now, Eric even said it, we're, the digital age is upon us. Now, I'm excited to see which municipalities embrace this economic downturn as a time to catapult ahead and where we were prior to that downturn. I think those that accept the challenge and embrace these technical technological innovations within their organization, you know, not just targeting companies that are in the in that particular business of those technological innovations to, to locate there, but actually drinking the Kool-Aid yourself and showing the world what these innovations can do when in the hands of highly capable, skilled municipalities. I think that will send resounding effects through the respective industries and ultimately enable the very business and technologies we are seeking to operate here in our region. So personally, it's just a, a better involvement and utilization of available technologies and means to embrace taxpayers, stakeholders, get their involvement, not just on social media, but a true way for them to voice opinion in a secure, transparent, fast, efficient way is really what will allow these municipalities and communities to grow that much faster. And then I think personally, that'll benefit my business and businesses. And, and I think that will also benefit the other gentleman as well. 
Awesome. No, that's great. That's really good feedback. And I think um, embracing innovation and doing things differently um, and, and really taking the way that we've had to adapt during the pandemic and making that part of business as usual um, is, is certainly important. Something I know all cities are thinking about how to, how to continue to do that. You know, um, uh, Brian, same question for you. Um, you know, what's going to really help you continue to thrive and, and um, over the next, you know, six, 12 months? Um. I'm not quite as eloquent as Adam, I don't think, but uh, I think that uh, some kind of return to return to business, I guess. Um, uh, we all had goals and aspirations before this whole thing started. I think we need to refocus on that. We've adjusted our business model, but um, in my specific situation, we're looking at expansion. We'd like to push our product out to the entire valley. So that's kind of what we're on the cusp of. Um, and just getting back to that, like uh, getting back to, you know, our, our long-term plan of doing that. And also, I think that the, the, the towns and the municipalities could also focus on that, like, like getting back to goals, getting back to, you know, things that you were striving to do before uh, COVID hit. Um, those things shouldn't go away. They should come right back. And, you know, this isn't something that's going to stay around forever. So hopefully everybody can push back to, um, like expanding what we're doing here pretty much for all of us oh great great points really appreciate that it was very eloquent um <laughs> and uh, eric same question for you what what do you what do you think uh, moving forward i know you've talked about you've been able to weather the storm you've got a great community um of folks that are supporting you on social and, and the coffee community but anything um, that is currently helping that you want to see continued or what's really going to be that game changer for you over the next six to twelve months yeah, um, I think ways it just comes in the form of care um, and the idea that we can see the picture and not just small issues, um, but, but if we really like care for um, just like making sure that people are okay and businesses are okay and, and I think just not being self-centered, um, I think the really, the, the whole will be you know, greater than the sum of its, um, and it's that, like, we, we need to just stick together in all this and, and not just be, you know, worried about our own stuff. Um, I think we really, not to complain, um, I think I fail daily at that, but I've tried really hard not to, and in a lot of ways, like, we're in the agriculture business, um, and coffee, and, and so the farmers are really the people getting it the hardest, um, so I've been trying to reach out to them and through up through uh, and and just say hey like what can we do to to buy coffee better and to do better at this and that seems to be like received really well and i think applied in, like more broad spectrum just just about everything else that's going on not just you know our own businesses um is huge and um, I think in terms of resiliency, um, we can we can plan for things like this that will inevitably happen again. Um, I think <laughs> it's like nice to think like, oh, we're just done with it and um, we can try to like look towards a, an easier, better future. But I think the companies that have done the best are often companies that were prepared for something um, like the, the inevitable. And I think... In ways just um, saving, repairing, and and having foresight is what creates resiliency. So um, I heard about companies we had just a disaster savings um, in which they were able to allocate and bonus their employees out basically immediately when things started kind of getting worse. Um, and then they were said, yeah, we can close for six months and be totally fine because we have prepared savings. Um, so I think if we're all honest with ourselves and, and kind of prepare for the craziness of the future, um, when, when things are done, I think that will resiliency for the future. No, that's, that's a great response. Really good points. And I think, yeah, I think this has made us all realize that, you know, we have to be more aggressive with um, our savings and our preparedness and making sure that, that we are, are um, able to weather um, another um, 
uh, crisis, you know, and who knows what, what form that crisis may come in. Um, but it certainly, I think, opened a lot of people's eyes, both personally and in their business, um, on, on maybe some things that they could do to put some of those um, safety nets in place. Uh, we are coming quickly to the end of our uh, panel time, but I wanted to leave some time for questions. So I'd encourage folks, um, as we mentioned, to put some questions in the chat. There have been questions, I think, for other speakers that have been answered, but um, I did want to go back up to the very beginning. Um, we have a, a participant here from um, Dayton, Ohio, and he had a question for Adam about um, if your project, or I'm sorry, if your product is similar to graphene, they have a, a large producer in Ohio, and he was wondering about your, your product a little bit more for Adam. Uh, so we take a natural graphite from a mine that's usually about 95%. Uh, we take it up to 99.5, I think we might be having more kind of losing Adam. Yeah, looks like you have a little bit of bandwidth, Adam. Oh, shoot. <laughs> In my video, will can you hear me yeah. now? There we go. Uh, perfect. Um, so yes, our product is a high purity graphite. Uh, many graphene producers utilize a high purity graphite to make graphene. Uh, we do have some intellectual property in graphene, but we focus primarily on the very large existing markets of uh, graphite, high purity graphite, lithium ion battery graphite, and things like that. Wonderful. Thank you, Adam. Um, I'm looking through the chat and uh, I'll ask my fellow um, folks um, on the, the host group if I missed anything, but I don't think I missed any direct questions. Um, however, uh, there's some really good information. So for anybody um, participating today, uh, really great comments in here about um, Adam mentioning um, his experience with crowdfunding, um, able to assist anyone who has questions about that. Um, but uh, with that, if uh, there are no more questions from the group, um, I can all go ahead and wrap it up and just say thank you to Eric, Adam, and Brian for being with us today. Really, really appreciate um, the time that you've given us. And uh, thanks everyone um, for the questions that you did ask and, and please um, keep them coming and we can certainly um, answer if, if these gentlemen are able to stick around with us. But at this time, I'll just turn things back over to Jeff Marcel. Thank you so much, Jen. I really appreciate it. And thank you to our panelists. That was fantastic. Um, so now we're going to take, uh, we're going to transition. We're going to move to the part of the conference where we do our breakout sessions. And so the purpose of the conference and really the goal for today um, has been to identify gaps, the needs and opportunities for small business support programs and efforts in the East Valley area. Um, now, in these breakout sessions, we want you to think about and list priorities and, uh, and determine how stakeholders in the East Valley community uh, can come together and execute on those priorities, what next steps are going to be needed to move forward on those things and make them a reality, um, and who is going to step up to take on these things. Um, and that, so we want to be really specific about the conversations that happen in these breakout sessions. So now you, the vast majority of you are going to be uh, are automatically placed in the breakout rooms in just a moment. We'll have about 45 minutes during these breakout rooms to have a conversation. It's going to be a facilitated conversation. And so we have a moderator for each breakout. I'll describe each breakout just briefly. The first break, one breakout we have is the title is Leveraging Resources and Developing Partnerships for Regional Success. And that's going to be facilitated by Jen Graves. The second is reaching business owners, marketing and programs and services. And that's going to be facilitated by Jay O'Donnell. Um, the third is providing equitable and inclusive small business support services. And the facilitator there is going to be Doreen Cott. Um, and then the fourth is going to be preparing small business for a post-COVID economy. And the facilitator there will be Will Novak. And I'm going to be taking the fifth breakout room, and this is going to be dedicated for all of the folks who are not from Arizona. Um, and this is going to be where we'll discuss best practice models that you're seeing around the country dedicated to supporting small business and entrepreneurs. 
Um, now, as I said, most of you are going to be placed into a room automatically. Those are the ones that we had contact information and we know where you were, you were assigned. Some of you um, have not been assigned yet and you're going to have to select, but I'm going to ask once again, if you are not from Arizona, please join me in the fifth breakout room where we talk about best, best practice models um, because we wanna make sure that we catalog all of that for the National League of Cities. The other four breakout rooms are really intended for the Arizona stakeholders so that they can come together and identify ways that they can work together and, and take action on things moving forward. Um, so I think that's all of the directions that we need. Jen, uh, Todd Goins, did I miss anything or is there anything else that you wanna share with folks in advance of the breakouts? No, I think you hit everything. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and as he mentioned, when um, I open the breakout rooms, those of you who've been pre-assigned will be sent automatically to your room. Um, for those of you who we didn't have information, you'll be able to see an abbreviated um, description for each room, and then you can choose where it is that you proceed with your 45 minutes. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It looks like most of us have rejoined the session. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to thank everyone for participating in the breakout groups. Um, and just to mention that I hope you enjoy the conversations in your sessions. I know I really enjoyed going between the different groups and catching just little snippets of information that were being shared. What we wanted to do now was ask each of the breakout sessions to just share a little bit about um, what you were able to talk about. We'll break it up into a couple of parts. Um, one being asking your um, speaker, your um, contact to just give us one or two highlights from the group discussion that they would like to share with the rest of us. Um, maybe also mention, you know, what was it that your group members seem to want to do first? Like what is the short-term action people could do after this meeting? Or maybe what folks seem most excited about? And then where do you see also um, long-term actions? What are some of those bigger goals and actions that folks would want to work on over that long term? And um, with that, I think I'll turn it over to our first group. Um, about um, reaching, uh, leveraging resources and developing partnerships for long-term success. I believe that was Jen Gray. So I'm gonna do my best. We were a little all over the place. I wanna thank everybody for their contributions. And I'm gonna ask Kylie, who was my note taker, to please help me uh, remember all the things that we talked about. That was a, a quick 40 minutes um, of time. But, you know, we started off talking about, you know, existing partnerships for success. And I think um, Visit Mesa shared, you know, how they really come together to support and promote the entire East Valley as a tourism entity, as a destination marketing group, and um, really bring uh, folks together. Um, and we, we elaborated a little bit on, you know, what Adam and Brian had talked a little bit about um, in terms of, you know, what partnerships are, are working. And I think um, uh, some of the key takeaways there um, Kylie, if you could help me out with that, because like I said, I would have need, definitely needed my notes, and Kylie took notes for me. Being remote is not as easy with the re re recall. Yeah, I can definitely um, step in and uh, fill in some of the information. So we had a lot of really good conversations. Um, you know, what what's what are some of the missing gaps among communities and municipalities and small businesses? Uh, we talked about available resources and how you know, there is some lack of connection and awareness of services from economic development offices, um, understanding what types of partnerships are available. You know, if a small business is getting started, you know, how do they find incentives? How do they learn about the programs? You know, um, sometimes it's, uh, they have to go to different websites through the Arizona Commerce Authority or the city um, you know, and they're just trying to get started and getting their business up. So it can be a little difficult. Uh, we also definitely talked a lot about how best to market our services and discuss, communicate these programs. You know, we're, um, we're always looking for ways to get out, get more information out to the businesses in our community. So what is the best method? And, uh, our group talked a lot about word of mouth and how important that is. And, you know, with the word of mouth, making sure our platforms are streamlined, our information is clear, concise, it's easy for them to apply, it's easy for them to find the information they need. Uh, when it is easy, they're going to uh, share that information with their friends, with their other uh, 
entrepreneur friends. Um, so if it's difficult, they're not going to talk about it. Uh, we found that some of the small businesses in our groups, um, they actually found out about different programs through uh, their brokers or their, um, you know, landlords. So that's definitely something for us to all think about. And then, you know, continue to think about how to make connections and figure out how to partner up and have these events that, you know, connect Urbex with a funder who can provide them with additional money. You know, they're just keeping those thoughts in mind would be definitely help everyone out. Um, and then I guess one last thing that we did talk about is, you know, financing and how to help businesses. And, you know, we're hearing that it's not just money that businesses want, you know, and there isn't a magic number. $5,000 may be enough for one business and not enough for another. Um, but for business, for uh, cities to consider other ways to assist businesses, uh, Urbex talked about how they uh, rented or leased land from the city of Mesa, um, you know, maybe thinking about property tax cuts. Um, so other items besides cash definitely should be considered to assist our businesses um, now and into the future. And just the last thing I'll add to our part of our report out, Jen, was at the very, very last, I asked the question to our service providers that were on, you know, how can we better collaborate with each other and do regular check-ins? I think um, the Chamber of Commerce um, does a really good job. All the Chamber presidents get together on a regular basis. And I think, um, you know, a, a kind of a cross, you know, collaborative conversation between like the chambers, the economic development groups, the SBDCs, the, the, the tourism groups that is happening on a regular basis on what we're hearing from our collective, you know, communities and the folks that we're engaged with every day. And then how are we then coordinating our resources? I made a, a comment about, you know, we're just getting ready to launch a grant program and some other things um, for the business community um, that council just approved. And we're still putting the finishing touches on it. And I didn't even think to reach out to SBDC to have them help me then promote that maybe to their clients that they're talking to every day. That's a, you know, certainly when you're in the moment, you don't think about maybe that next step and that next partner who can help promote you. So how do we be intentional about maybe getting together more often? Um, of course, we all have a lot of meetings to go to, um, but I think, you know, we miss that opportunity to, to keep those connections top of mind. So right at the very end, we were talking a little bit about that and how we're more intentional with as service providers for the business community, how do we intentionally get together to make sure that we understand what the issues they're facing? So that was just one extra thing I'll also add. Great, thank you very much. Our next group was focused on reaching small businesses um, by marketing your programs and services. And that was my group. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for staying with us. I. Um, I want to make sure to uh, to give opportunity to to um, the folks who are on the on my side. If I've missed anything, please speak up at the end. But one of the one of the things we focused on was messaging and key messaging, and um, we all agreed that leading a conversation with "I'm Jay from the government and I'm here to help" would not be a good way to start a conversation with a small business. There there seems to still be an inherent distrust about um, folks who are working for the government and really being there to help, even though we are. So, um, you know, making sure that we are clear on what services and programs we're going to offer either collaboratively, collectively, or individually, and making sure that um, we're, we're telling the business community um, specific, specific examples on how we can help them. Uh, one of the suggestions that uh, we talked about was utilizing the vehicles that are already in place. Um, we have a business retention and expansion program like other cities. And so we're, you know, hitting 100 to 200 companies a year, uh, meeting with them to talk, ask them questions about what they need. That's a great time to talk about our services and programs, as well as our partners' services, services and programs. Um, Visit Mesa has um, an ambassador who goes out on a regular basis and meets with new business uh, and, and to try and help, um, you know, garner additional partnerships. 
So being really uh, deliberate about our key highlights and um, also customizing the message and the approach to the business. So really finding out what, what they want to learn about and what they want to hear. Um, how to reach them was also uh, high on our list of priorities. And everyone agreed that direct contact or word of mouth is the best and most effective way. So how do we deploy a larger group of folks? Maybe there is an ambassador program that we can put together um, that functions kind of it, on an individual basis or an individual municipal, municipality basis, but um, ha, you know, in spirit cooperates regionally to disseminate information. Um, we also talked about having an infrastructure for inventorying new businesses or all businesses. The city of Mesa does not have a business license or a business registry. So we have to put together a bunch of different lists if we want to try and reach any businesses. It would be really nice to have a single database to work from. Um, talking about longer term or even shorter term, the, the ideas that we shared um, revolving around regionalism, um, I thought we came up with a good idea about uh, cooperative uh, training and education so that um, we are coordinating our content for small business training workshops so that if you are a small business in Mesa and, and Queen Creek um, or the, the location happens to be in Queen Creek for a really amazing webinar um, or, or seminar, you just have a single location or virtually you can go there as well. Um, but we would all be promoting it. And, and that way, I think we're leveraging resources, um, saving money because we're promoting one thing regionally versus, you know, we're doing a marketing seminar in Mesa and then four months later, it's the same thing in Queen Creek, same thing four months later in Gilbert. That doesn't, that doesn't really help anyone. So keeping the focus really on the small business and how and when and where they wish to communicate. Um, so thinking about how we might also develop uh, this center or a single point of information for small businesses starting up or expanding where they could go and get kind of a general checklist or general FAQs. And then if they had more specific information, then they can go out to the individual communities. So that was, uh, that was it in a nutshell. If, if Kimberly, you have anything to add or Chris, I think you're still on the line too. Yeah, um, kind of touching back on that. I think that that's definitely where I think the most efficient manner is going to be is getting into that central information base um, starting with a regional um, platform where everybody can come together. We can all work together as far as the information that we're trying to get out to even the specific areas. Um, and by collaborating in one location and then having essentially, I mean, even like what we just did today where you have your, your one big group and then you go into your breakouts. It's almost like having your regional group and then having, say, subgroups within that regional group. So each city could have their own subgroup within the one big picture. And then again, inside of those, you could even have your subgroups for specific industries that are inside of each of those cities. But all of it still comes back to one central source and, um, and makes it so that everybody's still on the same page while being able to look at specific situations and things that are going to benefit you most as an individual while having the convenience of one focused area for all of that. Thanks, Chris. All right, Jen, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you, Jay. For our third group, they were focused on identifying, um, you know, strategies for providing more equitable and inclusive small business services. 
So yeah, we had a really um, great discussion as well. And um, some very similar themes that have already been reported out um, came up during our our small group. But one of them really is the struggle to reach businesses. Um, in some cases, um, what was experienced, especially as we're trying to reach businesses during COVID were some language barriers. I know um, City of Mesa with your grant program, you provided applications in a series of different languages, but struggle to reach them and get them engaged with what resources there are available, whether it be you know the city, the town, or even above that. Um, and part of that maybe has to do with the trust of those businesses with the, the government. And so how do we, um, and, you know, and I, a lot of it, I think, um, Jay, you just pointed out like that personal reach to these businesses. And so it doesn't become just the government. It becomes that, you know, do, well, Doreen at the town of Queen Creek and I met with her and you start to build, build that trust with your businesses. Um, we talked about um, gaps in, in resources and the importance of identifying the partners to help fill those gaps. And so we had you know, we, we talked about the educational partners and, and, you know, the different groups that are out there and, and how we, we bring them into the fold and, and reach our businesses. We also talked about how quickly cities and towns develop programs, um, you know, when COVID hit. And so we, we need to learn from this experience and how we were able to pivot so quickly. And we can't forget about that and, and use this as a lesson so we're better prepared when something like this um, were to happen again. Um, and so maybe we're not scrambling as much, but to, to use this as a, as a learning lesson. And I also think too, that you can do things maybe more quickly than you think. Um, we were forced to do it and, and we did. So I think those were some of the, um, the big topics we talked about for action um, in the short term. You know, th there was discussion about possible changes in the local procurement policies to get more local or minority owned businesses connected and um, you know, into government contracts. And so looking at that as a possible um, tactic. Um, and then <clears throat> there's been some technical assistance programs that have been started um, because of you know, the CARES Act funding. And how do we continue that technical assistance? There are businesses that truly need that. And um, we need to you know, look at how the cities or towns can continue providing that funding to those businesses that need that after the CARES money um, has been depleted or is expired. And then similar to one of the ideas that the other group talked about, um, but um, the idea was brought forward about maybe a virtual incubation type program at an East Valley level or East Valley platform. So we have a one-stop shop for businesses and again, to Jay's point, we're pooling resources. So Queen Creek's not off doing something, Mesa, Gilbert, Chandler, you know, Tempe, but we're pooling those resources, creating a virtual incubation platform that any business can participate in across any of our great cities and towns. And then in the long term, um, we realize that working capital is still, you know, a gap for some of these businesses. And so maybe look at creating micro loan programs to provide that capital, um, you know, maybe new or enhanced programs to address this. And then with our larger agencies that provide resources, maybe having them take a new perspective on the types of assistance they provide. Um, sometimes it's more about their numbers, you know, and the types of businesses that they help, but maybe they, they take a fresher perspective and and reevaluate how they help um, businesses and the resources that they provide those very green startup businesses. So those are some of our general um, general topics. Um, Marissa, I know you were the, the note taker on that. If I miss anything, feel free to chime in, but I, I think that really covered the, the most of our conversation, so. Okay, I think we're good. <laughs> Thank you, Doreen. For the, excuse me, the fourth group spoke about how to prepare small businesses for a post-COVID economy. Yeah, I was the, the moderator or whatever you want to call it. I mean, it was, it, it's interesting that even though all of us had different topics, to some degree, it sounds like we all kind of ended up talking about some overlapping things. So I don't want to repeat anything we just heard from the last three, but we kind of overlapped with a lot of that too. Um, 
I think one thing our group talked a lot about, we, we really focused on like a lot of the mom and pops, the small micro businesses and how much this has been a challenge for them to pivot to this whole whole new world. And what can cities, towns, municipalities and nonprofit type organizations be doing to help? And I think we really, something we seem to really key on is, you know, really since post-World War II, cities have kind of done business in one certain way. And there's been, I think even pre-COVID, uh, people have been looking at doing things, you know, more mixed use type development, more, uh, a less burdensome regulatory environment. And perhaps COVID is finally the thing that pushes us over the edge into loosening up some of these things. I know the city of Mesa, we've uh, got grant programs for signage and have been a lot easier for businesses to work with on, on signage things. We have uh, new programs to allow people to do more outside street side dining, things like that, that maybe used to require a bunch of permits and a bunch of headaches. And for a lot of these small mom and pops, especially immigrant type owned businesses, English isn't the first language. It's, it's not just the Augie and our group had a really good phrase. I think he said, it's not just the language barrier, it's the language of business. Sure, you can translate these complex forms into Spanish or Mandarin or whatever language, but still it's so, it requires this sort of assumed level of understanding, hey, what does the city do versus what does the county do versus what does the state do? And, and a lot of these businesses just don't have that background or that, that knowledge of civics. And that alone is a challenge and they don't know where to turn to. Um, Let's see, uh, who is, uh, Laura, we were lucky. We actually had a, a, a journalist in our group, Laura. So she was our note taker. So I assume she took fabulous notes. Laura, what, what sort of fabulous things did we talk about? Um, I think you really kind of um, hit on the major points that I had, but you, everybody kind of echoed the same sentiments. It was really the trust that there's a lack of um, trust in government for a lot of these small businesses because they're immigrant owned or um, coming from diverse communities. And um, uh, I think that there's the, the short-term goals really coming from, um, like Lauren made a good example, I think it was Lauren, that was advocating like, uh, no, it was Augie, um, uh, making small changes to restaurants, um, just, um, putting up a website or doing an online ordering platform where a lot of restaurants haven't had that for these mom and pop restaurants. Um, Reimagining signage, uh, making small tweaks to jumpstart businesses. Um, and then Kim mentioned making um, technological changes, um, new ways to do business and how we'll continue to help businesses in the new platforms. Um, you know, all of these businesses were like paper based and now they're transitioning into these um, to these online platform services and they need help with that. Um, and where are the resources for helping those and how we can help people transition to that? Um, definitely talking about city um, city codes for business, and reimagining what new innovations um, businesses are bringing to the table and seeing if we can reimagine businesses. And then, you know, long-term uh, pictures are that we need to retrain workers who are being displaced. Um, we need to, um, hold on, I'm reading through all of my notes. That's all right. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, that was a good thing. We did talk a lot about so, some of the jobs that have gone away and, and whether we, is it going to be municipal led programs leaning on the community colleges in Arizona, we're lucky we've got Maricopa County Community College System, which is one of the biggest in the country, if not the biggest, and um, sort of retraining a lot of workers who's this new normal may mean the jobs they had don't exist anymore. And then we also talked about kind of the environmental impact of all this, you know, on the good side, there's probably been less driving. So it's been with people working from home. So great for air quality, but then everybody's buying everything remotely and having it shipped and more packaging. And, and what does that look like? And I don't know, towards the end, we got a little depressed, guys. I'll be real. We were trying to be positive at the end and think of good this stuff. And we, our good stuff segment was very short. So if any but of you- No, we actually, at the, at the end, business is coming up with new solutions and new business innovations, learning new skills and 3D interactions, 
um, new zoning opportunities, different ways to do things. And like you said, it takes big things to make big changes. And, you know, we're, we're shining bright lights on equality, making businesses who have never had access to capital are now forced to seek out resources and are coming together in the community with engagement and involvement. So, I mean, really, like, these are huge things for, for things. Yeah. All right. Laura, Laura's more positive than me. I, I spun out there at the end. <laughs> all right. Yeah. I Thanks, guys. That was great. Um, for our final group, I'll turn it to Jeff, who led the um, out-of-state folks who have joined us today to kind of glean their expertise um, on how to support small businesses. Sure. Thanks, Jen. And we, we had a really good conversation. We talked about a lot of different issues. One of the issues that I think folks are going to be grappling with around the country is funding and keeping these nonprofits and business organizations thriving and, and alive during this time downturn um, when budgets are going to be tight for everyone. And that's a challenge everybody's going to be trying to deal with. Um, we did talk about some national best practices. In fact, I want to thank Doug Lean from the city of Auburn, Washington. He shared with us a, a, an amazing national best practice program that they have underway. It's really centered on their uh, Auburn by local program, and they've taken an innovative approach to their business license promotion, pro, their business license program, and have actually used that as a promotion vehicle for their local businesses. So not only do you do you get a business license, but as a part of that business license, the city then in turn uh, promotes you and markets you to the the community as a whole. That's a really innovative approach, but they're doing several other things. And I just wanted to thank him for that. Um, some other trends that we're seeing, we asked folks about trends they're seeing in small businesses and with entrepreneurs. And there's certainly some areas of need. And I think we heard this in some of the earlier comments. There's this need for additional support in di digitization and market research as companies are growing, moving forward. And I think ultimately um, the uncertainty was the theme of the discussion for everyone. Small businesses are, are waiting for the next shoe to drop is, was a quote that we had in our session. And that's, that is true. Um, and so those were the topics that we talked about. Great, thank you, Jeff. I think um, it's interesting you know, seeing some of the themes that have carried through all these breakout sessions, even though all the topics maybe started off a little bit differently, but. Hopefully some of the you know, stories that we've heard and highlights from these different groups are things that you can take back with you after this session. Um, at this point, I will turn it back to Jeff for our closing remarks from TIP and then from our East Valley community. Super, thank you, Jen. And just, just to begin to wrap things up, the first thing I wanna do is thank all of the attendees. We had fantastic attendance yesterday and as, as, as well today. Um, really appreciate everyone taking the time um, I know everybody's incredibly busy, but taking the time over these two days is really appreciated. I also want to thank the speakers that have participated over the last two days. They have been remarkable with the amount of information they've shared. I want to recognize and thank NLC and specifically Kirk Ross. Um, but I want to especially thank and recognize our East Valley partners, the city of Mesa, the, the town of, of Queen Creek and Gilbert, you all have been so good to work with. You've been outstanding partners to work with over the last several months in building this program, certainly over the last couple of days. And I'm excited about our partnership moving forward as we compile all of the information and conversations that we've had. So I wanna recognize them and thank them. Um, I also wanna acknowledge and, and recognize Jen Todd Goins, who has been with our team at TIP Strategies. She has been orchestrating things all along the way and has just done a remarkable job. She has poured her heart into this effort. And I wanna say how much we appreciate it. And thank you, Jen, very, very much. So over the last two days, we heard about innovative data-driven approaches to supporting small businesses. Um, we were inspired by programs that we learned about around the country that are currently underway. Um, and following the conversations, specifically the conversations we just had, I would encourage you to move forward with the items, the, the actions, the things that sparked in conversations that you had today. Um, don't wait on those things. We at TIP Strategies over the coming weeks are gonna be pulling together all of the conversations that we had, all of the material that was gathered. Um, we'll share the data and the national best practice examples 
that we're, we're compiling right now. And we'll distribute that to the National League of Cities in just a few weeks, and everybody will get a copy of that material. Um, but if there's something that you discussed, if there's something that you thought, gosh, here's a model we could take on, or here's something we can do together, take action now, because now is the time. This is when you are needed the most. Now, the conference has been recorded. We're going to share a, a link. We're going to send out an email to all registrants so you'll get a chance to either review um, the, the conference, or if you had to step away, you can see the portions you didn't get a chance to see. But we should have that in the next day or two. So that you, please look out in your inbox for that. And lastly, I want to close with a couple comments, um, uh, especially relating to, to Will's comment he just made. You know, these can be depressing times, right? This is, these are rough times for everybody. And I, I fully get that. But I do know that. Um, economic development professionals and economic development programs uh, have never been so important in our entire lifetimes. They have never been more important than they are today. Um, and so I know these are difficult times. It's true in, in Arizona and the East Valley, but it's true around the country. But difficult times don't last. We will be moving through this recovery. Um, and your small businesses, your op entrepreneurs are the bedrock of your economy and doing everything that you can to support them to stay successful and strong through this period is worthy of your time and attention and effort. Um, so I have absolute confidence that the East Valley community is going to continue to keep working together as you have done so well in supporting small businesses. It's been a pleasure to be with you over the next last couple of days and thank you so much. And now let me turn it over to our East Valley partners. I, I believe we're going to start with Jay. So Jay, please. Sure, thank you, Jeff. I just wanted to also uh, echo Jeff's comments. Thank you to all the participants today. Your feedback is incredibly important. Thank you to Kirk Ross with NLC and Jeff and Jen with TIP Strategies. I also wanted to thank my uh, Mesa Council member, Jen Duff, who ac actually uh, suggested that we apply for this grant opportunity. Um, I may not have seen it otherwise, so thank you to, to her. And then my counterparts in uh, Queen Creek and Gilbert, Marissa Garnett and Jennifer Graves, uh, your support has been really helpful during this process uh, and it's been a good process, so thank you so much. And then just for those who are, are participating today, uh, our partners and potential partners in the region, we, we want feedback. We want to make this an invitation to our partners to come to the table with us and, and offer suggestions. We can't build a program in a vacuum. We definitely need to rely on the partners in this arena who do this, the small business services consulting for a living. So um, please, engage with us and help continue the conversation. Thank you. Jen or Doreen, do you have anything to add? I wasn't sure when to jump in there. Yes. Um, yeah, Go definitely. ahead, Jen. So, um, uh, I wanna just obviously thank um, Jen and Jeff uh, with Tip Strategies and the whole team at NLC. Uh, for everything. It's been such a delight to be with you all over the next last couple of days. And, you know, shout out to Jay for rallying us as East Valley communities and, and Mesa for taking the lead on the application and, and bringing us all together. And, um, you know, the ideas and everything that's been shared um, today and yesterday um, really, really um, resonated with me. And I uh, want to just call attention to um, the fact that we have a number of members of the Gilbert Economic Development team that are joining us um, both yesterday and today. And I know that um, we'll get together after this and debrief and talk about how um, we can continue to support our businesses and work with all of you um, collaboratively to uh, continue to bring solutions uh, to the table. And I'm just really excited um, to uh, roll up our sleeves and to keep pushing forward and, and continue the work that we're doing together. Um, and I also just want to um, do a shout out for one of our council members, council member September. I know he joined us yesterday and for most of today and uh, just thank him for his time and uh, certainly Kylie 
um, on the team who um, uh, co-piloted uh, this and, and took it on um, to, to help. So thank you, everybody. This has been really wonderful, and, and I'd love to hear your stories today. Sorry. I'll just finish up. So again, I um, want to echo all the thank yous. Um, this has been a great experience. And um, Jay, thank you to you and the city of Mesa for taking the lead and um, getting that application in. I think it's been um, a wonderful experience. I think the, the last two days have been really insightful and there's been a lot of good information shared. I want to um, just give a shout out to Marissa on, on our team in Queen Creek. Um, she took the lead for us and did a great job and um, she just filled me in um, after all of her meetings. So thank you to her. But I, I do really feel that the information shared was great. I learned quite a bit yesterday with the panel discussions that we had. And then today, you know, just being with our colleagues, you know, once again, displaying our regionalism and our collaboration as we come together to talk about um, the ways that we, you know, have done things in the past and hopefully will continue um, into the future. We really do have something special and um, proud to work with all of you and call you all friends. And um, again, um, I think it's been great. And just a shout out to Brian with Old Ellsworth Brewing for all of his wonderful comments about the Queen Creek staff. It really has been a pleasure working with him and he's always um, just great to call upon to help out with things like this. And he's just, uh, you know, really embodies the true spirit of an entrepreneur. So I look forward to seeing some of the great ideas um, that were brought forward over the last two days implemented in the future. And um, hey, let's, let's keep this momentum moving forward. And um, Jay, when's the next um, big event? When are we gonna collaborate again? <laughs> Thank you. So now I think we're going to hear some concluding remarks from the National League of Cities. Kirk, did you want to make a comment? Yes, I sure would. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, thank you so much to all the cities, um, Mesa, and the towns of Queen Creek and Gilbert. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, we've been working on this since pre-COVID um, and it's been an absolute pleasure, like I said, being able to work with all of you. Um, it was a great conference. We really appreciate TIP strategies for being able to put this on. It, it couldn't have been a better topic at, a, at the right time. And, and I would just like to echo, echo what Jeff said about it is so very important that we all rally together to be able to provide these economic services to the small businesses in our community so we can build back stronger and better for the future. Thank you everyone for being here today. Um, and thank you again to all of our partners, cities and TIP strategies. Thank you everyone. Okay, well that concludes our conference and thank you all so much. Hope you stay healthy and successful. Bye-bye.